Hello, welcome back to the Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill, and my special guest this week, Nigel Farage. Nigel, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be back with you. It really is. It's great to have you back on, especially at this moment in time when you really are making waves and waves that really need to be made. Listeners will be familiar, of course, with the whole debanking phenomenon, with your extraordinary mistreatment by Coots Bank, who booted you out. We know we now know it was for political reasons, even though they originally denied that and said it was just a financial decision. And you've kind of taken up arms, I guess, against debanking and against the woke persecution of people by big banks, businesses, corporations, and so on. So let's get into all of that. And I want to kick off by asking you, what it was like when you found out that Coots was going to do this to you? What what did that feel like? Because in some ways it's a sign of the times, but it must be quite startling and disturbing when it happens to you as an individual. I was first aware of this phenomenon and the political application of debanking with my close friend Aaron Banks. Banks who had done a huge amount to actually get the Leave side moving in the referendum campaign. If, if Banks hadn't done what he did, vote Leave wouldn't have formed for months and months and months. You know, I, I doubt we'd have left. So Aaron is, to me, a really heroic, but outspoken, yes, but a heroic figure. And I was really shocked after the referendum when using parliamentary privilege, um, members of parliament like Sir Chris Brandt basically said, look, you know, the 8 million quid that he gave in, in cash and in personnel uh, was actually Russian money. Um, and he was reported to the Electoral Commission who spent nearly a year investigating him, came back, nothing to see here. Uh, Not satisfied with that, the DCMS then reported him to the Serious Fraud Office. I mean, it's hard to think of a more wicked act, frankly, without any evidence at all. And at that, and he had over 500,000 customers through Eldon Insurance and Go Skippy, the brand, the, the car insurance brand, and Barclays just said, that's it, we don't want your business. And it reached a point where the Barclay card was cancelled. Uh, people were trying to renew their car insurance, not able to. There were people driving around with uninsured cars. And, you know, Banks was on the verge of bankruptcy as a result of what these people had done. And I was horrified by it. But kind of a year or two goes by and you think, well, there it is. And I get the odd email into my coming through my website from people who've lost their bank accounts. But generally, they've been able to find another bank that would have them. Um, so with me, I mean, I, I opened the account with NatWest in 1980. And during the 1990s, for nine years, I ran my own uh, brokerage outfits in the city through limited companies. Um, I've run this current company that I've got since 2012. Um, and in 2014, NatWest said, we can no longer do foreign exchange for you. So, well, that's not much cop because I'm being paid in euros, you know, I'd, I'd really rather when I'm in Brussels, you know, or Strasbourg spend euros than, than, than go through um, a sort of competitive foreign exchange service akin to the booths at Gatwick Airport. Um, and they said, no problem, you can go to Coots. I said, well, I'm not really sure, you know, that I'm actually quite in the financial bracket. Oh, no, no problem at all. No problem at all. And so I went to Coots, and since Brexit... Uh, And since leaving the European Parliament, uh, my life has changed into broadcasting and one or two other business ventures that I've got going. Um, And, you know, there is, to be honest, a pretty healthy income going into that account. And I maintain I maintain quite a big positive cash balance. Um, And I didn't think there was a problem. There hadn't been a problem. I I took a mortgage out with them in 2017. No problem at all. Um, I paid that off early, which I was pleased to do. And then out of the blue. I get appointed a new account manager. Bloke never spoke to me for months, despite me asking to talk to him. Get a phone call, we're closing your accounts. I was a bit shocked. Um, I said, is this to do with literally exposed person status? It'll all be explained in a letter, he said. The letter came two or three days later, simply saying, we're closing your accounts, we want you out by this date. No explanation whatsoever. And actually, I felt pretty horrified buy it. And I thought, well, I'm not having this. So I wrote to the CEO of Coots, although I'm pleased to say he's no longer the CEO of Coots, but we'll come to that. (laughs) And I wrote to the CEO to say, look, what the bloody hell is happening here? I mean, you know, what have I done wrong? What have I done wrong? And he didn't even have the courtesy to acknowledge the email. He just got a senior member of staff to ring me. Um, 
And then I started to talk to one or two other banks who said, no, we can't do your business. The cost of compliance of you being a PEP are just too high. Um, and I began to get very, very concerned. And actually, I mean, to be honest with you, quite down about it. And I spoke to close personal friends. I said, I can't, you know, I can't go public with this because it's humiliating. It'll be taken by my enemies to be sort of a victory against me. Um, yeah. And then I started doing a bit more research. And I started to understand it wasn't just Aaron Banks, but actually an awful lot of people had had their accounts closed. And I began to think, well, hang on. We bailed these so-and-sos out in 2008 and 2009. And in return, they've shut 5,000 branches around the country. They're telling friends of mine that run cash businesses. I'm talking about window cleaners, fish stalls. They don't want their business anymore. They're trying to drive cash out of the system. And I began to realize, actually, this was happening to thousands of people. Uh, and I thought, in the end, somebody has got to blow the lid off this. And I didn't pick this fight, Brendan. This fight picked me. But you know something? Um, if you want to have a fight with anybody, don't pick Nigel Farage. <laughs> it's not a very clever thing to do. Uh, because when I do fight, you know, I take my jacket off uh, and I fight. So I started to push, started to fight. Uh, I discovered, and I'm ashamed to say, I didn't even know what a subject access request was two months ago. I did, I'd never heard of it. It just hadn't been part of my world. I put in the subject access request, and what I got back was 40 pages of, of, of bile, vitriol, prejudice on a level uh, that I've never seen. And that was when I thought, right, I'm going to go nuclear on this. Um, what is happening to me through this bank is not isolated to this bank. It's actually run right through the banking industry. It's been encouraged by the FCA, the regulator for the industry. And we're now at a state of deep politicization of banking facilities. Uh, there's a bit of this now running through the pensions industry. There are elements of this now running through the insurance industry. And so I decided my fight would be public. And what I wanted to do was to say to other people, please come out. I've come out. I want you to come out. I want to get a, a handle on the scale of this problem. And I'm delighted to say, you know, people like Grant Shapps, for example, explaining that his kids can't get bank accounts. Dominic Lawson wrote an amazing piece about his daughter, the one with Down syndrome, that couldn't get a bank account because her granddad had 40 years ago been Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, and that was when the avalanche began. And I say avalanche. I have never, in all the public profile campaigns that I've done, and one or two of them were quite high profile, thinking back over the years, I have never, ever received an inbox like this. These are people... Uh, exasperated, anguished, scared, confused. People have lost their homes, lost their businesses because of the way in which the banks have behaved. Yeah, that, that's a really useful outline of, of what's going on in this whole uh, very strange affair. Uh, and I wanted, following on from that, I wanted to ask you about why you think the banks are doing this, because it is bamboozling to a lot of people, I'm sure, I mean, the initial story in relation to you and other people was that you're, you know, you're just politically exposed persons and a politically exposed person is someone who is involved in politics at some level. And apparently that means that banks have to keep a closer eye on, on what's coming in and out of their account. We now know that in your case, at least, it goes far beyond being a politically exposed person. It's, it seems to be a much more conscious political act on the part of Coots. But why do you think banks are doing this? I mean, most people assume that banks look after our money and that's about it. We don't think that they're going to be making political judgments on who banks with them. So what do you think is going on there? And what have you learned about the banking system over the past few weeks when you've been raising awareness about what happened to you? So I've learned an awful lot over the last three weeks. I've learned that at one level, our interpretation of what a politically exposed person is, is so insane that frankly, it will stop good people off going into, not just becoming MPs, but even local councillors. So that needs to change. You know, I've learned that there is a, a tide of politicisation that is running through these organisations, and that the only way we can turn that tide 
is through mass public support for a campaign. Because, frankly, these views are extreme minority views. The vast majority of people want banks to be banks, not to be political in any way, and certainly not one in which we own 39% of it through, <laughs> through paying our ever-increasing taxes. So I've learned that. I've also learned that there is an outright attempt to kill cash. They want cash out of the system. They want total control of our lives. And it's no coincidence. And this, is, this, by the way, is not a conspiracy theory. I promise you. Don't switch off, folks. But the government, as we speak, are employing people, well-paid people, to set up a proto central bank digital currency that will be operational from 2030. But that is actually happening. And so for that to work, of course, you have to drive cash completely out of the system. And what I've also learned, lastly, is that you cannot live, exist and survive in the 21st century without a bank account. It is as essential, frankly, as electricity and water. And this is happening to far too many people. We used to have the basic right to a bank account in law. And it was there until Savinsk Cable privatized the post office. That right has now gone. Our neighbors in France and Germany, everybody has that right, and that's how your benefits are paid, etc. So, so long term, you know, that's what I'd really like to fight for. But what is really extraordinary, even before we get to CBDCs, is the extent to which now banks are controlling our lives. I've looked at some of the forms for the know your customer rule. I mean, they're now reaching a level of intrusion uh, that is absolutely astonishing. And they're controlling our spending. No, they really are controlling our spending. I had a kid, 19 years old, lovely letter from him, a university student, works in the student union bar, and he saves 50 quid a month, which he puts into Coinbase, an FCA registered legal financial services company. And this kid's investing 50 quid a month into Bitcoin, Ethereum, and some of the rather stranger ones that exist out there. Um, and why shouldn't he? And they've told him, any more transfers to a legally FCA registered company, they will close his account. Other wealthier customers who've been going into crypto, and look, you know, it's not for us here to say whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's a perfectly legal activity to do so. Um, wealthier customers having limits put on their accounts or their accounts simply closed. And, and I, I think unless we stop this, I think they'll use our bank accounts to control the number of flights we can book every year. I, I really can see that not being too terribly far away. So I think this is a big moment. Um, I've, I've scored a bit of a victory in that I've exposed the fact they've been lying. I've exposed the fact they've been leaking. I've exposed the fact that these banks think they can act above the law. And actually, in the end, they can't. Um, and I just, I just love, you know, the email that says, Dear Mr. Farage, I don't normally agree with you on politics, <laughs> but... And they're the ones that I'm enjoying getting more than anything else, because you begin to think, actually, the, the, the majority for common sense out there in the country is actually overwhelming. So what I've done, Brendan, to sort of update you on, 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 on all of it, um, is you know I simply can't cope with the onslaught that's coming in. So I've set up, or some professional friends of mine have set up, uh, something called accountclosed.org. And you can go to accountclosed.org, and we ask you a, ser we, we ask you a series of questions. Um, you know, whether you're concerned about what's happening in the banking industry, etc. And if you have had your account frozen, suspended, then we want to know your details. Uh, we want to know which bank it was. And if you haven't already submitted a subject access request, we tell you how to do it. And I think it's going to be a goldmine of information because there are two things that need to happen here to put this straight. Number one is a cultural change a serious cultural change. And by the way, in the case of NatWest, that's easy because the government's the biggest shareholder. So government, please stand up. And by the way, you know, Andrew Griffith, to be fair, and Rishi Sunak have responded incredibly quickly. To this. And I think that's because they knew there was a problem bubbling away, but no one dared actually talk about it. But the other change we're going to need, and this is really important, because let's remember, financial services, we've always prided ourselves 
on being a global centre. It's always been our biggest source of invisible earnings from overseas. And it employs people, not just in Canary Wharf and the city, but, you know, in Birmingham, Cardiff, Tunbridge Wells, East, but they're, 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 they're where you go, there are people working in financial services. And so we need the world to look at us as having a clean but efficient and cost-effective financial services industry. You cannot do that without a banking system to back the whole thing up. And right at the minute, the world is looking in at British banking, saying what the hell is going on. And this is because of a whole series of international agreements picked up by the European Union and others and turned into anti-money laundering legislation. Now, we all know there is the international drugs trade that launders tens of billions of dollars every month. We know there are human trafficking scams. We know all these things that go on. But the legislation, as it's written into law, the application of that by individual compliance departments, the culture of fear of being fined by the FCA or whoever it is, has led to a situation where we are using an almighty sledgehammer to miss the nut. Because we're not actually catching the international money launderers. <laughs> we're actually hitting innocent people and small businesses. You know, any unusual, you know, let's say, for example, I don't know, you've got an old motorbike. You've got an old Harley Davidson in the garage. And you've decided, you know what, I'm over 50. It's no good anymore. Uh, you know, and you sell it for four grand and the, the buyer turns up with cash. You turn up at your bank with that. I mean, suddenly, suddenly, you know, you would think that you were a front for a Colombian drugs gang. And there's a very good chance that the bank manager won't take the money or will suspend your account. Or so, so we need we need Parliament to look at this legislation to make it more sensible. It isn't working. Hi, it's Brendan here. I just wanted to remind you that you can still buy my book. It's called A Heretic's Manifesto: Essays on the Unsayable. And I've really been blown away by the response to it from readers, reviewers, Spike supporters. People really like this book, and I think you're going to like it too. It covers all the insanities of our time, from climate change hysteria through to COVID authoritarianism, through to the trans ideology. And it basically makes the case for more freedom of speech, more debate, and more heretical thinking to challenge the conformism of our times. So what are you waiting for? Go to Amazon right now and order my book, A Heretic's Manifesto, Essays on the Unsayable. And now on with the show. Yeah, one, one thing I found really striking about the, the left's response in particular uh, to this affair, I mean, the left's response has been fascinating, grimly fascinating across the board. But one thing that stood out was the way they talked about uh, Dame Alison Rose, who was the chief exec of NatWest Group. She's one of the people who's now had to stand down over this extraordinary affair. Um, and we know that she was the source of the BBC's erroneous story about why your account was closed down. Uh, and some of us predicted that the response to this might be, well, you know, why is the right picking on Dame Alison? Is it just because she's a woman? Is this bullying? And lo and behold, that is uh, w what happened. What do you think that tells us about the, the state of politics on, on sections of the left today? My fear with this is, and I'm not taking political sides at all, and this is a completely apolitical, non-political campaign. I want to make that absolutely clear. I think that's vital for its success. But my fear is this. The reaction of Rachel Reeves, fellow chancellor, to Dame Alison Rose, who broke the first and most fundamental rule of banking, which is clan confidentiality. She then got her board effectively to back up something that was a lie, which was directly contradicted by Simon Jack. And somehow the shadow chancellor thinks that it's quite wrong that she's been bullied out of her job because she's a woman. But I tell you what, I couldn't care less whether she's a woman. I couldn't care less what religion she is. I couldn't care less what ethnicity she is. All of that should be completely and wholly irrelevant. And yet there are, and by the way, Keir Starmer did say supportive things, and I was very pleased that he did. But if we have a Labour government that is so obsessed with identity politics that people get treated differently according to which particular group they're in. Are they in a favourable minority or an unfavourable minority? 
So I do think, um, I do think if we're going to get change, it's going to need to come PDQ. Um, it was been said in the past that royal commissions, Macmillan joked about it 60 years ago, that royal commissions are a way of kicking things into the long grass. But actually, a royal commission you know, headed up not by a bunch of career politicians, but actually by you know experts in the law, in financial services. Um, you know, maybe that's the way to proceed. But 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 as I say, my big fear is we need these big changes. But if Rachel Reeves becomes our shadow chancellor, what hope will there be? I'm not surprised at all that you're getting so much response to this because what you refer to as the deep politicization of banking. Everyone is concerned about this. So many people I speak to think this is an outrageous development and what happened to you is shocking and and it's something that concerns people enormously. I think one thing that shook people up was the dossier that you got through your uh, inquiry into into why your subject access inquiry. And I wanted to ask you about that because when I read it, I was really taken aback. I mean, it was like the kind of documents that the Stasi used to draw up on dissidents in Eastern Germany, you know, all the terrible things they think, all the people they associate with. And and I think what will have shocked people about that dossier is that lots of those views that they pointed the finger at you for holding are views that lots of people hold. Lots of people support Brexit. They're critical of net zero. They're critical of identity politics. How did it feel when you saw that dossier and you were reading this uh, indictment that was issued against you, essentially, by people in that bank? Well, I'd expected a degree of prejudice. You know, the kind of prejudice you only, you can only get from upper-middle-class white people with double-barreled names. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I mean, they are a very unique lot, and I can give you the postcodes they live in right now. <laughs> um, you know, but they're in charge of so much in our country. Uh, I was horrified reading it. I mean, some of it was funny. You know, I know Novak Djokovic. Oh, my <laughs> goodness me. I mean, what am I supposed to do, go into hiding? I retweeted what I thought was an hilarious Ricky Gervais joke. I mean, you know, but some of it was absolutely vile, and I was quite shocked by that. I did not want to put this in the public domain. I knew that it was dragging up accusations and allegations that were made against me a decade ago um, and which had been disproven. I certainly did not want to reheat this idea that somehow Banks and I were funded by the Kremlin, and yet the report mentioned Russia 144 times. It's just mind-blowing. Even more than Brexit. Brexit was 120-odd. Russia was 144. But I had to publish that at great damage to myself, because for the haters out there, it's reinforced everything they've wanted to believe. And I've, I've seen, since I published that, actually on the street, you know, some really quite fresh anger and hatred directed towards me. But I had to publish it, otherwise I could not beat the lie that had been given to the BBC and accepted by media as the real reason for the account closing. I had to publish that document. Um, so, yeah, um, it's been, that part of it has been, has been you know, a little bit gruelling. Uh, but it's all been worthwhile because suddenly many millions have woken up to what's going on in this country. If they can debank me, they can debank you. And we learn that Refinitiv, who are the biggest of the global providers of creditworthiness for individual customers, we now know, the Times, in fact, uh, put this story out to begin with a couple of weeks ago, but it's been verified. Refinitiv are now planning to work with all of our big clearing banks to monitor the social media of every single one of us. Fact. Fact. So, you know, you may not be a high-profile person, but you've got an account on Facebook or Twitter or X or whatever we're supposed to call it now. Um, and there'll be, you know, there will be keyword searches. But if you use that language in your posts, you could be in trouble and lose your bank account. So this is real. This is, this is real. This is coming down the tracks at us rapidly. The banks are completely and hopelessly out of control. They've got to be brought to heel. Yeah, absolutely. I did want to get your views on the media response to this as well. You mentioned the BBC earlier on. You mentioned Dame Alison Rose breaking client confidentiality. And we know that she was at a, a posh charity dinner with Simon Jack from the BBC. And so when you first revealed that your account had been closed, this was before you got hold of the dossier, um, 
the BBC guy, Simon Jack, and lots of journalists on Twitter were just laughing their heads off saying, how ridiculous of Nigel Farage to say this. This isn't a political decision. We now know from the horse's mouth that it was just a financial decision. So isn't this an indictment of the media establishment as well as the banking establishment? The speed with which they were willing to dismiss this story. I, I argued uh, that it, in the Daily Mail that it, it points to Farage phobia, but also to a broader unwillingness to ask serious questions about what's happening in the corporate world and, and the banking world and the political yes. world. Yes. Yes. Oh, we've got our answer. That's lovely. We can all go out for dinner now. Um, yes, without any real curiosity. To be fair, though, I mean, you know, I've been against the FT for 25 years. They wanted us to join the euro. Remember? Everyone's forgotten that. I mean, they were the biggest cheerleaders of us joining the euro. So I've never had, well, I've always been cordial with Financial Times journalists. Um, but, you know, never had much nice written about me. And amazingly, you know, I spoke to one of their top blokes who'd followed the Simon Jack line. I said, look, you've got to change this story. I sent him the documents. He spent some time with it. He said, Nigel, we're going to correct the story. I thought, wow, that's interesting. That's logic. It is, and then blow me down if last Saturday there wasn't a whole page on me in the FT about the campaign that I'm fighting written, you know, from a pretty objective point of view. As for the BBC, uh, Simon Jack was deeply reluctant um, to, to you know, backtrack. Um, as somebody said, it's the first story he's broken in years, and it turned out to be the wrong one, <laughs> um, <laughs> which may be unkind. But you know what, Brendan? It may have taken six days. But to get a big organisation like the BBC, and to get Deborah Turnes, who is the CEO of BBC News, to write me a full public apology... That doesn't happen very often, which is why I accepted it with good grace. It took a bit of time, but we got there. But initially, oh, yes, initially, this fitted the prejudice. This fitted the Farage phobia. And since then, I have to say the media have been pretty good with me on this. I, I've got no complaints over the course of the last week or so. I think they realise that their own readers and viewers are concerned about what is going on. Um, so it's been, a, it's been a remarkable few weeks, uh, a really remarkable few weeks, and I just hope now that people do continue to help me to help them through accountclosed.org and we'll put together big groups of people, many, many thousands of us. And that's going to give us strength. It'll give us strength to go before parliamentary committees. It'll give us strength to make arguments for reform and change via the media. Uh, and, and, and that is what I intend to do. And, you know, as I said earlier, you know, I didn't pick this fight. It picked me. But hey, you know what? I'm there now. I'm over the top. Um, <laughs> I'm out in no man's land. And I'm not going back. I think, yeah, it's it's so interesting, as you say, firstly, that Keir Starmer said some supportive things and that the media is not being as cutting against you as they might have been previously. I think that's all very interesting. I think people recognise that this is an important campaign and a serious problem has been exposed by by uh, the things that you've put out there. Um one final question I wanted, I, I did want to get your opinion, Nigel, on politics generally, especially politics in the United States, and what you think is going on in the kind of culture war more broadly. I mean, one of the things, of course, one of the ridiculous elements in that dossier that you discovered, um, the fact that you've had link ups with uh, Trump was held against you, the fact that you've had friendships with certain political figures. I did want to get your view on what you think is happening in relation to Trump in the US. We know that he's going to be indicted on charges of trying to overturn the election result. We know that there are numerous legal cases being dangled over him or pursued against him. Do you think, as Trump has said, do you think there's an element of a witch hunt here? Do you think there is a slightly undemocratic, underhand attempt to prevent him from uh, standing for office again? What's your reading on what's happening uh, in the United States politically at the moment? Well, you get tribal lines on this. You'll get Democrats who hate him, who say, well, this proves the point. He's a real bad egg. And you get Republicans that say, oh, well, you know, he's our man. He's our warrior. He's taking on the deep state. And then you get people in the middle who are the ones that matter. It is very difficult to be a fair-minded person and not to look at the American judicial system as being more politicized than the UK banks currently are. <laughs> and, you know, it's there. And, you know, Trump may have made some mistakes, may have done some things wrong. Fine, we all do. But when you compare that to Hunter Biden, to a piece of evidence this week suggesting that the vice president was on open telephone lines to people in communist China 
corrupt Ukraine and Moscow on 20 occasions, and that the drug-addled Hunter Biden made millions, it may even be tens of millions, for all we know, out of that connection. Uh, you know, if you're fair-minded, you can see the laws being applied in one way uh, heavily and in the other way in a very, very lax way. Look, I think the fact is uh, America's in trouble. America is in trouble. Uh, the political divide is great within America. The, the risk is that we lose everything about our Western world civilization. We lose all of the values that we built up and developed and evolved over centuries. And if America falls, we all fall. And Trump may well be, in the eyes of many, a blunt, and some may say crude, instrument against the deep state, against a surveillance state, against um, you know, the, the extraordinary kind of identity politics that we see on the West Coast. But you know what? From my perspective, at the moment, he's the best we've got by a long, long way. He is going to be the nominee. The, 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 there is no stopping that. And despite these indictments and whatever happens, I still think he's got a better than 50% chance of winning because I think Biden has made such a mess of America and American cities. Um, yeah, as for our politics, this side of the pond, there isn't any. There isn't any. We've got two parties that basically advocate a high tax, big state solution to virtually everything. There's so little to choose now, it's extraordinary. Nigel Farage, thank you very much. Thank you.